the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patient. Chairman. Now, the goal of my office has been to ensure an effective, transparent, compassionate response. Frankly, it seems as if all three have failed. Uh, and not to point fingers because none of you are involved. Again, Mr. Kotz, if anyone else is supposed to be uh, made as a saint, it should, so should shall you, because the only transparency has come from your office. Uh, for example, uh, my uh, office, as well as eight or nine other members of Congress, Senate and bipartisan, bicameral, requested the chance to look at an unredacted copy of the IG's report. Now, some of the redactions seem to pertain to someone's name, but others are just redacted. I have no clue what's behind there. We sent that letter some time ago, I've never received a response, asking committee staff an unredacted report has not been sent nor made available. Why can't we get a chance to look at an unredacted report? Uh, Congressman Canley, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know whether or not there are Privacy Act restrictions that come into play. I'm willing to look at it in a room without windows, with you standing behind my back to make sure that I don't take notes. But as I try and ensure a transparent response to people for whom transparency has been totally lacking, except for Mr. Kotz, uh, why not? I don't know. I'll find the answer out for you, Congressman. My understanding is that a lot of the redactions have to do with um, maybe about ongoing investigations or other sensitive matters, but I will get back to you with a response. Sounds great. Um, FINRA apparently, or your predecessor, in September of 2003, sent a letter to SEC suggesting that this may not be on the up and up. Mr. Ketchum, who did, 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 did FINRA, your predecessor, send it to the Fort Worth office or did they send it to the D.C. office? Because it seems like, if you will, blame is being put on the gentleman who was in charge at Fort Worth. And, the, and again, the lack of transparency has made me a little bit concerned. Do we know that, that higher-ups were not culpable? and are uh, negligent. And so I'm asking, that report sent from September of 2003, to whom did that go? The, the communications between the SEC and FINRA were done at the Dallas and Fort Worth offices. Uh, I think actually the, the letter you're referring to, or at least the primary letter you're referring to, was, was a letter from the Dallas-Fort Worth SEC office to FINRA uh, providing a partial referral to the thing. But no, Part of the problem, I think, on both of our sides was an absence of escalation. Uh, it stayed at the two offices. Okay. Now, uh, one of you, maybe Mr. Conley, um, I understand that SIPC will, will cover Madoff because the stock transactions were fictitious, but the, the underlying value of the CDs was fictitious. So why does the fictitious nature of the stock transaction of Madoff qualify for SIPC coverage but the fictitious value of the CDs does not. Congressman, this is one of the questions that the Commission is now looking at. The victims in this case, through the Stanford Victims Coalition, have made the argument to the Commission, uh, they've met with the staff and made the argument, and also in letters to the Commission, that they believe that the uh, CDs in this case should, should qualify as fictitious, and therefore they should be, assuming they are customers, they would have an argument that they were entitled to the money that they invested. And that's a question that the Commission is looking at currently. Uh, I understand Commission so far has been negative regarding that argument. Is that true or not? There is, there's been no determination made by the Commission at this point. That is something that is, that is currently under review by the Commission. Now, let's assume that they rule against. Now, I'm a physician. I know if a physician does something bad, negligent, there is other recompense. Frankly, this is bureaucratic agency negligence. We've heard that. Will there be another, or is there sovereign immunity, or will there be civil cases allowed against SEC for, frankly, totally failing their responsibility? Uh, I don't, I, Frank. I'm Does SEC sure. have sovereign immunity? Uh, as a general matter, I believe um, uh, there is sovereign immunity, uh, and I believe there have been some lawsuits filed. Uh, I don't know the current status of them. Can you all let us know that? Certainly, Congress. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, also, with the receiver. Now, I actually know some of those broker dealers. They said that they showed up for work one day and they were told, go home. The receiver was there. He cracked into their account and he paid some IT people a lot of money to sit and go pull up lists that if they had, if they had stood behind him, he could have opened his account. They could have checked the documents he pulled down against the Pershing accounts. And all those billable hours that Jambi racked up are gone. So more money would have, been, would have been there to compensate victims. Now, I know the courts had told Jambi to downgrade his charges. The court was offended by the number of charges. 
going forward is there going to be a review of the procedures used to instruct receivers so that they can't maximize billable hours when there are shortcuts to the same thing? Congressman, uh, we vigorously check bills of receivers, and in this case, in fact, on a number of occasions, um, have achieved reductions in those bills. I understand that, but my, but my fundamental question is, there was an easier way to do it. You just stand behind the guy as he opens it up, and you stand behind and have an IT guy there to make sure that maybe he opens up a similar computer with the same password, so somebody who knows about computers can make sure it's not a game going on, and boom, you have all the accounts. And you don't take two months racking up IT, I'm sure $200 forensic accountants, et cetera, when you say, well, here's the Pershing account data that Stanford is using, here's what you showed me, why don't we do it that way and save a heck of a lot of dough? I think that's, a, that's entirely appropriate and that should happen. As the SEC, we don't control the receiver and to some degree the court is responsible ultimately for dictating um, how and in what method the receiver approaches his task. But we have been doggedly following his expenditures and suggesting ways that he can do things more efficiently, including not spending money chasing assets that are overseas that are already subject to freeze orders. Uh, so it sounds like uh, it's not just, uh, it's understood that this particular receiver is problematic. I guess my question is, what does Congress have to do? I'm not on this committee and it's by the indulgence of the chair I'm here. What does this committee or Congress need to do so that uh, receivers operate within certain guidelines? I keep returning to this, but the perception is the guy's just racking up billable hours. Man, it's a gold mine. I'm sure he's made partner. The fact is that there's cheaper ways to do it are there guidelines that can be, you know, promulgated to help the fellow do so? Um, Congressman, I'm not sure that that's something that Congress could promulgate, but um, we'll take a look at it and get back to you. Okay. You've been indulgent. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Good questions. Uh, all good panel uh, questions.